uh, but they were not going to be able to. So we should be recording now. Okay. And we'll be able to pass the recording along uh, once it's available. So, but I have two o'clock on my clock. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the session started. We may have a couple of individuals join us um, because we're a small number of individuals today. I can individually tailor this a bit more. We can make it a bit more conversational. If you have questions, certainly feel free to let me know. Um, yeah. And you know, if, if there's a section that we don't feel is necessary, we can skip over that. Um, the idea being is because there's so few of us, I can really tailor the session more so toward your needs. So don't hesitate to jump in and let me know if, if that is the case, if, if we can change it up a little bit to make it better. So this is the second of four presentations I'm doing this fall related to cognitive load, uh, cognitive load theory, and cognitive processing. Um, and really, today's session, as you can see, is going to be focused on strategies to minimize extraneous load. Um, extraneous load is really just wasted cognitive effort, meaning learners are doing something cognitively, but it's not really supporting the learning that we want them to experience. Uh, and since we have such limited capacity for learning, we want to minimize that amount of wasted effort that's happening. So we're going to talk about some strategies to do just that today. And just to confirm, you both can see my screen, correct? Okay, very good. Okay. Yes, I can see. Thank you, Serena. Thank you. I need to unmute it. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, this can be very conversational. So we have three main topics today. We're going to start with a very brief review from last month, um, just to sort of set the stage for today's conversation. Then we're going to shift into the demands on cognitive processing. Um, there are three of them, and, and one of them is this idea that there's uh, extraneous processing, and when we experience too much extraneous processing, um, that specific subtopic is going to really lead into our last topic for today, which is going to be the bulk of the, the session today is those strategies to minimize extraneous processing. So a brief review uh, from last time. These are the topics that were covered. Um, we talked, we started with the definition for learning uh, and the definition. And in fact, a lot of what we're talking about comes out of this book, e-learning and the science of instruction by Ruth, Ruth Colvin Clark and Richard Mayer. Um, I know Dr. Mayer is out of UC Berkeley um, or UC Santa Barbara, excuse me. Um, and he and Dr. Clark and several other researchers have done extensive research on these topics. And, and you'll actually see a number of the studies presented on screen as we go through. So if you're interested in any of this, you can pull a lot of that from there. I'm more than happy to share a PDF copy of this presentation with either of you. So if that's something that interests you, let me know and I'll get that to you after the fact. Yeah, I would like to like a copy of it. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll just send it to both of you. Um, oh, yes. I, I Yeah, thank you. I also want a copy of it. Yeah, and I'll tell you too that um, in in the notes section for a lot of the slides, there's additional information that you won't see on the screen today. Uh, so, you know, if, if you're interested, you know, you can poke your your, your eyes through the, that as well and, and perhaps see even more information. Mm -hmm. So the definition of learning that's put forth by Dr. Clark and Dr. Mayer is basically that learning is a change. It's a change in knowledge or skills. And that is a result of some experience that learners engage in. So we're really looking at a change in knowledge or skills as a result of some experience. And as you guys know, we have a number of different formal experiences for students in OUWB. We have the didactic lectures, there's self-directed learning, team-based learning, labs, et cetera. Um, so those experiences, the hope is we're, we're you know, helping cause that change in learning, um, creating you know, future clinicians. We also looked at three metaphors for learning. So these were sort of this, this evolution of cognitive science over time. Um, they start with the first metaphor being response strengthening, um, which you can see in, in non-human um, animals. You know, we see response strengthening in dogs. If, you, if you're familiar with the work of Ivan Pavlov, 
Um, yeah. Classical conditioning. You can see response strengthening there. It's, it's a behavioral change caused by stimuli. And that sort of uh, melded into information acquisition and ultimately got us to what Dr. Clark and Dr. Mayer describe as the knowledge construction metaphor of learning. Um, and that, and really what you're seeing in this evolution of learning theory is that the role of the learner becomes more and more active. So, you know, one of the big take home points is that if you want genuine learning to occur, participants need to be cognitively active. And that can, that can correlate with behavioral activity, physical activity, um, but you actually need learners engaging with the content, with one another, with you. Um, and so a lot of the strategies that they present are, are sort of rooted in that main idea. And they talk about some of these uh, principles and processes that govern how learning happens. And so that's actually expanded upon in this next slide, uh, principles and processes. So they lay out three principles for learning. Dual channels is this idea that people have separate channels for processing visual and pictorial information versus auditory and verbal material. And they really hone in on those two forms of perception uh, as they pertain to multimedia presentations. Um, now, of course, there are other ways for us to intake information. We have olfactory senses. Uh, we have tactile senses. Uh, we have the ability to perceive information through other means. But in formal learning settings, primarily information is being conveyed in one of two ways. Again, either visually or auditorily. So that's the first principle is that there are two channels through which we can share new information with our learners. The second principle of learning is limited capacity. And that basically is people can only actively process a limited amount of information through each channel at any given time. Um, but by taking advantage of two channels and, and being intentional about presenting information, both verbally and auditorily, we can sort of expand some of that limited, limited capacity um, you know, presenting some information visually while also sharing other information auditorily. And then finally, the last principle is active processing. Um, and that really states that learning occurs best when people engage in appropriate cognitive processing during learning. And that's gonna involve attending to the relevant material, organizing that material into some coherent mental representation. So that's happening internally. And then they have to take that internal structure that that they're building and they have to integrate that with pre-existing information um, and you may have heard of that referred to as like schema theory very very similar and so these principles of learning really govern how learning happens what some of the limitations on learning are um, and all the while learners are going through some processes during learning um, without which you know if learners don't go through these processes learning doesn't happen. So that involves learners selecting the correct words and images. So the first thing that they must do is pay attention to the relevant words and images in the presented material, and they have to listen to what you all, the instructors, are saying. The second thing then is once they've begun that process of paying attention, they need to begin mentally organizing uh, the material that they select into that coherent verbal or pictorial representation, sort of this idea of conceptualizing what it is they're seeing, what it is they're hearing. And then finally, they have to integrate that new knowledge with pre-existing knowledge already stored in long-term memory. And again, small group today, if there are any questions as we're going through, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. I do have the chat up. So if you feel more comfortable, put something in the chat, you can. Um, if I don't see those things, however, I'm just going to proceed under the assumption that you're both sticking with me so far. So... This gets us into our second area then, um, demands of cognitive processing. So this really starts to lean into the impacts that instructors have and content builders have on the learning process. You wanna be mindful of how you present contact, content through both channels associated with, again, a multimedia presentation. So again, how are we presenting information that could be perceived through that auditory channel? How are we presenting information that could be perceived through that visual channel? 
All of which is to say, you know, how does what you present impact students' ability to go through those learner processes? That, that again, is selecting the correct words and images, organizing those words and images, and then integrating the, that, that mental representation that they're building. Remember, we want learners to be actively, cognitively engaged. So what that involves is, again, them building those mental representations and adding that into long-term memory. Remember, too, that learners have a significantly limited processing capacity for intaking information. So anything that you present that isn't essential may detract from learners' understanding of the core elements of your lesson. And that's going to be sort of the central theme for the remainder of today's presentation is being lean in what we present to students um, with intentionality. Um, it's very easy as experts in our field to get into the weeds on certain topics because we know this stuff, we love this stuff, we're passionate about it, we have a lot of motivation about it, um, but we have to be mindful of who our learners are, what their needs are in any given session um, and try and balance that as much as possible. Yes, you want to, and as we get into like December's session, uh, this idea of fostering generative processing, we want our learners to be motivated to learn more, but we don't wanna present so much detail um, and really unnecessary detail that learners are actually not selecting the correct information or organizing. Because again, that, that ends up being wasted effort and it actually has adverse effects on learning as we'll see as we get into some of the, the research that supports these ideas. So there, there are three demands of cognitive processing. I've already alluded to some of these um, on screen, but we have again, extraneous processing, essential processing and generative processing. And these start to affect learning in that if we see that there's too much extraneous processing happening, uh, essentially meaning that the cognitive load that learners are experiencing is overloaded because there's just too much content on screen, some of which is essential. You know, it supports the main idea of what we're trying to get across in any particular session, uh, but some of which is also attributed to non-essential information. So we're really focusing on the, this first part today, the, the too much extraneous processing, and how do we limit that? And as we get into November, we'll, we'll focus more on essential processing, and then in December, we'll focus on generative processing. Uh, but this sort of gives you a heads up of where we're going today, but also where we're going in the months to come. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the bulk of today's presentation is gonna be focused on these strategies to minimize extraneous processing, and there's four of them. Um, I'm going to leave these on the screen for a moment. Just take a drink here real quick. <clears throat> so we'll spend a little time today looking at these four principles. We're going to examine how to apply these strategies in lessons that you create and lead. Um, and we're also going to review some research that exists to support their utilization. Because you may see some of these and go, does that make sense? Because intuitively, some of these things you stop and you look at it and you go, I don't no, like I have, I, I have, you know, good reason to include the information that I do, but there, there is research to support some of this and, and we want to apply best practices. Um, and I, I think too, it's important to note that there are some boundary conditions for these principles and they don't apply equally in all situations. And Dr. Mayer and Dr. Clark are very quick to point out that there's a lot more research that needs to be done related to these principles. Um, but what we're trying to present is the best information that we have now so that students can have the best experience possible. So we're going to start with the coherence principle. <clears throat> what I have on the screen there is actually a picture of um, a parking sign from Los Angeles. Um, and you can't even see the whole sign, actually. It's it's cropped um, so that you miss some of there's There's two, I believe, additional sort of signs underneath the ones that you can see there. Um, and what's happening is there's just so much information being conveyed um, that it's overwhelming. Um, and a lot of it doesn't pertain to individuals who are reading it at any given time, because if you look at it closely, you might start to realize, like, does this pertain to me? I don't know. What day of the week is it? What time of the day is it? Um, so there's just this volume of information that's that's being shared um, with good intentions, but because of the way in which it's presented, um, it's actually 
sort of falling on deaf ears. Um, and, and perhaps you both have experienced this at one point or another, trying to decipher road signs. Um, coherence principle really gets into this idea of you want to avoid adding unnecessary material. Um, and that in doing so, if you add too much unnecessary material, it can actually negatively impact learning. It really gets to this point of try and keep your lessons uncluttered. Um, because when learners are using, again, that limited cognitive processing capacity that they have, trying to process extraneous, unnecessary details, that's actually allowing for less capacity to process what we really need them to understand. So what does this look like in process? And you could probably quickly visualize uh, what that might look like. So I created a couple of fake PowerPoint slides just to sort of show what this might look like. Um, but extraneous on-screen text. So let me go back here. We have we have two examples. You know, we have a presentation on the left that's sort of in violation of the coherence principle, and we have a presentation on the right, very similar, uh, which is supposed to be in adherence with the coherence principle. Well, what's different? Probably pretty quick to identify. There's just a lot less text on the image on the right. On the you know the mock presentation on the right, um, the image is a little bit larger. It's again this idea. Of, so and actually, when we're presenting, remember we have dual channels. So when we're presenting this information, anything that you present on screen, whether it be text or images or videos or, or, or otherwise, uh, that's all being processed through that visual cortex. Um, and when there's so much information being presented on screen usually it's an abundance of text, um, it's overwhelming. Um, so what the coherence principle is really getting at is sort of limiting sort of what learners have to process through that visual cortex and filling in some of those gaps. Because yes, there's less text in that example on the right than there is on the one on the left. So where do we fill in the gap? Well, that's where we take advantage of this idea of, I can present a lot of the detail the supporting details auditorily. That is what I'm actually speaking during my presentation. So big, big idea here is unclutter your lessons, aim to have as little text on screen as possible. Um, you know, certainly main points, you want to get that across. And I will tell you that in my presentations, I'm, I try to be mindful of this and it's difficult. I look at slides in this very presentation. I'm like, there's very likely more text on that slide than, than there should be. But if you can be mindful about trying to reduce that, that volume of text on screen, um, again, the evidence supports that that's beneficial for learners. Let's take a look at some of that supporting evidence. Uh, and, and the coherence principle stretches across a few different ideas. We'll get a, in fact, let me go to the next slide quickly and we'll go back. The coherence principle really relates to this, to, to sort of four sub ideas. Um, it's avoiding extraneous words. It's also omitting extraneous words that are added to expand on key ideas. And so when I go back, the, what we're gonna look at is really related to this sub idea here. Um, it's also related to limiting or eliminating extraneous graphics. Um, so, you know, I don't, in what I've seen at OUWB, I don't see this it very often. Uh, but you may at times see instructors present a graphic that is sort of decorative, um, but doesn't really enhance the learning experience. You know, if we're talking about histology, for example, and I have a fun little animation, but it has nothing to do with histology, uh, that actually may end up being distracting for learners. Um, you know, they end up paying attention to that rather than what we actually need to pay attention to. And this applies to extraneous audio as well. So let's go back here for a second. Um, and this is related to that idea of avoiding extraneous words. So what they did, Mayer, Griffith, uh, Drickowitz, and Rothman, is they created a study where, um, and sort of teaching students about um, how foreign bodies might enter into a host cell, they provided one set of students a high interest statement, uh, which included some extraneous words that sort of, the idea was to sort of make the, the lesson more interesting, 
Um, but what they were talking about had to do, you know, we can see some of the sentences here and, and I'll read it out. It says, you know, a study conducted by researchers at Wilkes University in Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, reveals that people who make love once or twice a week are more immune to colds than folks who abstain from sex. Researchers believe that bedroom activity somehow stimulates an immune boosting antibody called IgA. Dot, 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 dot. So what they're doing is they're adding this sort of these these interesting details about sexual activity and how that may reduce the likelihood of getting sick. Um, juxtapose that with the low interest statement, which says a virus is about ten times smaller than a bacterium, which is approximately ten times smaller than a typical human cell. A typical human cell is 10 times smaller than a human hair. Therefore, it can be concluded that a virus is about 1,000 times smaller than a human hair. Now, in a vacuum, it may be difficult to discern why one of these statements is more valuable than the other. But the idea here is that we're really getting into a topic that is more closely associated with this statement. So the, the low interest statement isn't contextualizing the information in some other setting. It's really just focusing on the most fundamental facts associated with the larger topic. Uh, and what their findings really pointed to was that students on a post presentation transfer test uh, scored higher, you know, when they experienced the low interest statement versus those students who had the same visual, but with the high interest statement. And the conclusion here was really that because students were then thinking about possibly sexual activity or things like that, it took away from their ability to make sense of what, again, the key information was. Um, so it, it, it relates back to what we talked about, you know, at the beginning here is adding that unnecessary material can negatively impact learning. Usually it's done with best intentions or sometimes it's even done unintentionally. Um, but again, we see a circumstance here where unnecessary detail actually hindered learning. And again, I tried to identify a number of different studies. I, not, I shouldn't take credit for this. Mayor and Clark identified a number of different studies, many of which you could see Dr. Mayer himself was involved in um, that sort of support these ideas related to the coherence principle. Any questions on that before we proceed? No. Yeah. So next we get into the contiguity principle and there's two, sort of two subsets to this principle. There's the spatial contiguity principle um, and then the temporal contiguity principle. So we're gonna look at these uh, in parallel. The main points about the spatial contiguity principle is that you want to align written words to corresponding graphics. So what does that look like? Um, here we have two images, very, very similar, conveying a lot of the same information. Um, probably pretty quick to identify what the difference is here. And you might even look at the image in the left and be like, well, what's wrong with that? Um, they, there was actually a study done that involved eye tracking. Um, so in the example on the left, the spatial contiguity principle is violated because the labels indicating the different parts of the brain are physically separated from the image of the brain itself. So I have to look at A and I have to come down here and read frontal lobe. I have to go back. I have to read B and I have to come back. And so there's a lot more eye movement that is happening here. You know, so they're, they're using letters instead of the terms themselves to match yeah, Varna, did you have a question? Yeah, so, you know, one thing, <laughs> what I want to know is that in the left side, they've marked A, B, C, D, E. So whenever we are giving a presentation, so I may tell them that A is the parietal lobe and all, but I may leave it on the slide for them to, you know, it's like an interactive thing. So when they look on the slide, they have to make what is there, right? It can be an engaging thing by putting something like the left hand side. Yeah. Don't so it, if you're like an animation, just leave. It. Well, yeah. I mean, if your intention is to sort of get students engaged and maybe try and have them identify it, that's that's a little bit different um, than what 
you know, the spatial contiguity principle is trying to get across. So, yeah, I mean, if you're looking for a circumstance where you want students to identify sort of maybe without the key, you might present an image like the one on the left first and then have students go through and can you can you all identify what A is? What is B? What is C? What is D? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I might recommend then in that case is um, on a subsequent slide, say the very next slide, after you've gone through the activity with the students, um, mm -hmm. have that alternative image on the right, which then you know, is in adherence with the spatial contiguity principle where it very clearly um, oh, and closely key, represents. Key, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but no, no, and, and I think it is positive to give students, because again, what you're suggesting, Varna, I think is good in that it it's getting students cognitively engaged. They're actually gonna have to participate in something um, where they're really gonna have to think and they're, and they're certainly more active in an activity than they are if they're sitting here listening to somebody talk through all these points. So um, none of these, I think it's a good point too, in that none of these principles exist in a vacuum. Um, we're all going to present information as best as we can. And there's always gonna be room for improvement, I believe. And I'm, I'm guessing you both believe as well. Um, I think the goal is we just wanna do the best job that we can. Um, and I think by balancing these principles with building in activities and such into the presentation like it's all being done with best of intentions it's all intended to improve the student experience these are just little things that are easy to overlook um, but perhaps if you know better about them today you might go oh right cody talked about the spatial contiguity principle i see this in a presentation that i've done previously so i'm going to just make this little fix um because again the research suggests that this is what we should be doing for best practices. Does that answer your question, Varna? Yeah. Okay. Um, here's some good evidence that supports the use of the spatial contiguity principle. So here, Johnson and Mayer did a lesson on how a car braking system works. Okay, so they even did you know, they did the right thing in, in sort of keeping with dual channels in that in both circumstances, they provided both a pictorial model of what a car's braking system looks like, and they provided some text that was spoken and was on screen. Um, and the easy thing to, and actually what you're seeing here, the text here on the left is exactly the same as what's here on the right, but how it's laid out is a little different. Um, Again, using an eye tracking experimental design, they found that students who viewed the integrated example, so the one over here on the right, performed better on a transfer test than the students who viewed the separate example on the left. Essentially what was happening was that students who viewed the integrated uh, example, they were performing a greater number of eye movements between the corresponding textual elements and pictorial elements. Um, and making you, you can you can sort of reverse engineer this. And if I'm reading this block of text and I go and I, and I try and figure out, you know, what is what is this sentence, you know, what is this correlated with? What is this correlated with? What is this? There's more of this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and you're probably familiar with that circumstance where I'm reading a block of text. I review an an accorded or a similar image, a correlated image. And I got to go back and find my spot again. By presenting this way, I can more quickly identify. Okay, this specific information here relates to this component of the image, and then this information here relates to this component of the image. That's really the heart of that. What's going on there? So making those connections between the corresponding words and graphics, it's an important step for meaningful learning. Okay. Get that, and I apologize that I should have changed this to temporal integrity principle. In fact, I'm going to do that really quickly. Now that I've seen it, I'm never going to not see it. So main points about the temporal contiguity principle is that you want to time spoken words with corresponding graphics. So just to quickly juxtapose, spatial contiguity is about aligning written words so things that are actually on screen 
with their corresponding graphics. Temporal contiguity is about timing spoken words with corresponding graphics. Um, we sort of naturally do this when we're speaking because we're looking at something at the same time as our audience is looking at it by and large. So the temporal contiguity principle comes more into play um, often with pre-recorded content. So things that students are viewing asynchronously. So if you record a video and you're talking about topic A, but the image on screen is related to topic B, that's a violation of temporal contiguity. What you're speaking about is not in line with what it is you're showing on screen. Does that make sense? When there's that mismatch between what you're speaking about and what students are seeing, that can be very, very confusing. Um, so there's not really a great way to show this other, you know, the, one of the examples that they provide is this idea of you can have an animation uh, without any audio. Um, and, you know, that's better perhaps than, than no animation at all. But a way to improve that is if you have then corresponding audio to explain what's happening in the visualization. Um, so long as what is being spoken is related to what is seen. That's what we're really looking for with regards to temporal contiguity. Uh, yeah, Varna. I have a question. If you can go back to the previous one. Yep, right here. So, yeah. So what happened was uh, one of the examples I can give is that in my one of my lectures, I had uh, taken an animation from from you know from the internet, mm -hmm. but I didn't want all the details which the internet audio was giving. So what I did, I removed the audio and put this, but I spoke. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then what happened, that was, I was giving a lecture in the class and, or, so I had given that, but then uh, we provide the slides, right? Like right. In the slides at that time, the animation was going on with, without the audio, because uh, it's only in the video recording, you have my audio for this. So, right. So what do we do in such a case when uh, to these students in our school, we give asynchronous, uh, you know, video presentation through Panopto. Mm -hmm. And then we also give them the slides with, with, the, with the PowerPoint. Yeah, there's, there's obviously a number of different things that you could do there. Um, what I might recommend, what might be sort of, a, a best practice, so to speak, in that capacity. Because, yeah, you're right. We want to give students multiple avenues for for getting information, and uh, you know, perhaps a student attended the session live or even viewed it Zoom live, and they're just reviewing the PowerPoint later on. Um, what I might recommend as sort of best practices is on that slide, perhaps in just bullet point, you know, in, in bullets. Uh, outline the main ideas associated with that, uh, what, with whatever the image is trying to convey, uh, mm -hmm. but then also perhaps putting a little blip in there that, you know, if you wanna hear the corresponding audio description of this slide, be sure to review the Panopto recording. And if you wanted to go a step further, you could go view the Panopto recording yourself and be like, this is the timestamp for when we talked about it. So if you know, if you're if you just take a quick look at it and you go, we talked about this slide at the 29 minute mark, you could do that. But that's obviously, you know, an, an extra step that isn't necessary per se, but it just makes it all the easier for your students. Um, so again, I think just providing a brief textual outline for what the animation is intended to show, because again, mm -hmm. viewing it in on paper. Or viewing just a PDF of it, they're not going to benefit from the dynamic action that happens in an animation viewed online. You know, but we can we can account for some of that with a brief corresponding textual overview, mm -hmm. and then just pointing them to the resource that would already exist, which is in this case that Panopto recording. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I. I I think it's a balance of trying to, you know, not make significantly additional work for for you all, which, you know, your your faculty, you're very busy individuals. You know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. If if, if a resource already exists, mm -hmm. 
to account for, you know, in this case, a temporal contiguity principle, let's just point students directly to that resource. And they may they may look at it and go, you know what, I don't need it. I remember this. I'm good. Um, but at least I think you could perhaps sleep a little better knowing I am giving my students um, the best opportunity to succeed. But they have a role in this as well, of course. Serena, any questions at this point? Okay. Um, and again, here's some additional evidence for the contiguity principle. Um, and it really relates to sort of two subtopics. One is uh, that idea of placing printed words near a corresponding graphic. So that's when we're seeing words and graphics together on screen. So that's that spatial contiguity principle. And the other sub area of this is that idea of synchronizing spoken words so things that we're processing auditorily, not seen on screen with the corresponding graphics. And that's related to that temporal contiguity. So really just speaking about what students are seeing simultaneously, timing those two things together. And we see here again, a number of different studies that support um, the use, usage of the contiguity principle. And just trying to be mindful of time, knowing that we still have two more principles to go, I'm going to move on ahead. Mm -hmm. um, here we get into the redundancy principle and we have sort of a, a silly sign on the screen here. You know, it says left lane closed when closed. And well, yeah, of course, um, this really gets into, a, you know, um, you want to explain visuals with spoken words or on screen text and not both. This is sort of a natural extension of the contiguity principle, which we were just talking about. Um, and it happens a lot. And, and, and sort of this is uh, uh, an expansion on the coherence principle too, where uh, if you remember about five or six slides ago, we had the violation image with a, a greater amount of text on screen versus the, the adherence image, which had far less text. You know, the idea there being that we're just really pointing out main topics in on-screen text. And then we're using our voice to narrate the details. Um, the redundancy principle is basically saying that any text that appears on screen, the idea is that students are gonna process that on-screen text through the visual cortex, i.e. they are seeing it. Um, and if they're also trying to process the information through an auditory context, so if I'm, speaking exactly what is already on the screen, I am sharing the exact same information through both channels. So I'm kind of gumming up the system, so to speak. Um, the, the better alternative is I want what I'm explaining auditorily to complement, but not be identical to what students are seeing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perhaps, a, perhaps an example will help. Um, so in this idea, in this example with the violation image, this would be a violation if, and this is lorem ipsum text, it's, it's not real words. Um, I didn't want to draw specifically from anybody's actual presentation. Um, but this would be a violation if this text was explicitly stated aloud. Because again, then what's happening is students are processing the same information essentially twice. They're processing what they hear and simultaneously what they see. So if the idea is that I'm going to speak this exact text, it's better to remove it visually from the slide, and I often put this text in my PowerPoint notes, so I, the presenter, can see it, but my students can't, not live anyway. So remove that text and use this to guide your professional annotation of the slide, okay? So with an audio narration voiceover, you know, for a recorded lesson, you wanna use graphics on the screen um, and, and sort of limit the amount of text on screen, especially if your intention is to speak a lot of what you would otherwise be putting on the screen anyway. 
Um, and again, a lot of evidence supporting sort of two subcomponents of redundancy. One piece of this is that you want to omit on-screen text with corresponding graphics. The other is that you want to add on-screen text with corresponding graphics. So this is, again, I mentioned somewhat earlier, um, and I didn't get into this so much in the presentation today because I felt like we were already covering so much information. And if you're interested uh, at the end of the today's presentation, um, and again, I will get you both PDF copy of it. Um, they talk about Mayer and Clark. They talk about near the end of these chapters, some of the boundary conditions for these um, principles. And they talk about um, this idea that, there, yeah, there is still more evidence that's needed. Um, but in some circumstances, you know, depending on the type of learner, you know, so is this a novice learner? Or is this a more expert learner? There are actually certain circumstances where it may be better to um, provide additional on-screen text to correspond with graphics, depending on the type of learners. Um, often we're seeing that more so with novice learners, where they actually may benefit from that additional on-screen text. Um, it's tricky, though, because you never know, you know, do I have different type of learners in my class that might, you know, for example, if I'm doing a lesson on biochemistry and I have a student in my course who was a biochemistry undergrad major, but another student who was an entirely different discipline, how do I present information in such a way that best uh, provides for both? Um, I think the general goal would be try to limit the amount of on-screen text provide a lot of that detail through the auditory component of your presentation. Again, that is what you, the, the instructor is, is stating. Um, and I think I might've gotten into this a little bit, you know, what isn't known about redundancy is it has different effects on different kinds of learners, but also different kinds of materials and different presentation methods. Um, so different presentation methods can simply be anything that is uh, presented live versus presented in a recording, something like that. Any questions um, about this slide or about anything related to the redundancy principle? Mm -hmm. Perhaps the key take home here is that, you know, and Mayor and Clark state this, it's almost verbatim, you know, additional research is needed to determine the situations in which the redundancy principle does not hold. Um, and again, that's related to different kinds of learners, materials, and presentation methods. So our final principle today um, related to this idea of reducing extraneous processing is the worked example principle. Uh, main main idea here is that in certain circumstances, particularly complex tasks, we want to provide step-by-step -step guidance for how to complete such complex tasks. Um, so if you're covering a complex task procedure, such as diagnosing a patient, uh, to an expert, that may not seem like a complex task, but if you start to do some cognitive task analysis and you really write out each step that is happening internally when you're diagnosing a patient, uh, you may start to find like, actually, this is a bit more complex task than I might have realized when applied to a novice learner. Um, so if you want to convey how to go through that process effectively for, you know, a clinician in training, um, we want to provide first an entirely worked example. And then over time, fade from fully instructor-led examples to students doing more and more and more of the process themselves with each new attempt. Visually, what this kind of looks like, and I sort of reverse engineered a, a graphic that was in the Clark and Mayer text is, you know, if, if we talk about, and this is, this is obviously oversimplified, you know, a complex task is gonna be more than three steps more than likely. Imagine this is 30 steps rather than three or 33 steps. Um, what we might do in the first worked example is 
you, the professional, or perhaps a, uh, a guest in your classroom, you know, a clinical faculty member, might, uh, might go through the entire process and, and explain as you're going through what you're doing, why you're doing what you're doing, why you know that this is the right time to do that step. Um, and then as you go through iterations of that experience, so again, you can apply this to the idea of diagnosing a patient, allow your learners, allow the students to do more and more and more of the steps each time. You know, so on the second iteration, you might do 80% of the process and say, okay, here's where we're at. How do we, how do we complete this process? Um, and you don't necessarily need to um, explicitly do the beginning or the end of the process. In fact, you might do the first 20% if your if you're, um, topic at hand really relates to the middle component of a process. You might do the beginning as a worked example, open up the floor, so to speak, to have students provide insight on, okay, this is the topic of today's lesson. How do we do this middle third of this process? Leave that part open for them to do, and then continue with that worked example so that students start to see um, both what it is, they get that opportunity to actually practice what it is, but they get to see that sort of in a, uh, a larger context of, of an entirety of a process, okay? Um, and the, uh, with what we're seeing here comes from um, a research designed by Clark, Wynn, and Sweller from 2006. Um, and I don't think I stated this, but the blue boxes here are sort of indicating work that is done by the faculty member, that presentation, whereas the white boxes are more indicative of work that is being done by the learners. So here we're really seeing that that first time the professionals doing the entire process with students present and sort of annotating what they're doing. And then over time, the amount of work being done by the professional is being taken over instead by the learners. So they're getting the scaffolded approach to learning what it is that they're doing. And here's just some evidence uh, that supports basically, um, and, and just to point out again, we're, we're talking about complex tasks here. Different individuals may have different opinions of what constitutes a complex task versus an easy task. Um, these worked examples can actually hinder learning or be less effective anyway than practice exercise, you know, more traditional practice exercises for easy problems. But when applied to complex problems, um, doing these worked examples versus traditional practice exercises can actually have quite a bit of value, relatively speaking. Um, here are some corresponding principles um, laid out by Clark and Mayer um, associated with worked examples. Um, again, you want to provide these in lieu of problem assignments when the material is complex for learners. So when there's a high amount of essential processing, when the nature of what is being presented in and of itself is complex, these can work really, really well. You want to fade over time from worked examples to um, to more traditional uh, students from doing the work. Um, this can be really beneficial when paired with self-explanations, um, when students have to sort of self-explain what they're doing, why they're doing it, when they're doing it, uh, that actually can stimulate deeper processing of the worked examples, uh, which actually sort of gets you into the realm of fostering generative processing, uh, which we'll talk more about in December, but that's at that stage of students are starting to take that mental representation of ideas and incorporate it with what they already know. Um, being prepared is sort of the idea of principle four and you might get to a point and stop and say, okay, what are we looking at here? What are we doing? Um, and if you don't have students who can adequately explain what's happening, uh, it's a good idea to have a backup um, explanation for what's going on. Um, as an ex as a, um, Expert, you probably do already, um, but it's just good to be prepared for that potential. Uh, where possible, try and do this in tandem with other strategies, strategies that we may have talked about earlier today, you know, such as the coherence principle, the spatial contiguity or temporal contiguity principle. Um, and the last principle is, you know, this idea of supporting uh, tr far transfer. So that is an ability to 
do a process that you would first practice perhaps in a classroom setting or a faux um, medical setting, we want students to eventually be able to do this in an actual hospital setting or in a family clinic setting, you know, or an outpatient clinic, you know, any of, any of these settings that students might ultimately find themselves, that's where we need them to practice these skills. And so if we can create these worked examples in a manner that is authentic, you know, so perhaps using actual patient names rather than the patient, um, having students go through an actual diagnosing procedure versus um, something that's that's less authentic, that can be far more valuable. And again, here, just some, some additional research related to this particular worked example principle. Um, I do know that we're running up short on time. I, I try to be intentional about leaving some time at the end of these sessions for, for Q&A. Um, obviously, it was a little bit smaller group and we had some ability to do Q&A during the session. Um, this is what's coming up in, in the next couple of months. Um, so today was, again, really focused on strategies to um, minimize extraneous processing. So next month, we're going to segue into strategies to manage essential processing. And here are the corresponding principles for that. And then in December, we'll talk about strategies to foster generative processing. So, um, and again, here are some of the references. So if you are interested in some of these topics and want to explore in greater detail, um, a lot of, these are all permalinks from the OU Medical Library. Um, so when I get to you both the PDF copy of this, um, if you want to delve deeper into some of these topics, uh, these will take you right to the OU Library website so that you can do that um, because we have a free version of the text from which all this comes. With that said, um, I do appreciate you both attending. Um, in addition to the copy of the presentation, I'm going to send you a link for. Um, some feedback, if you don't mind taking a few minutes to do that, I do appreciate it. Um, I am more than happy to stay on the call and address any questions that you have or, or have further dialogue. Um, but certainly if you know you want your eight minutes of time back, I get that too. Um, but I'm gonna stick around until I'm confident that I've addressed everything I can. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I have two questions. I'm not sure. It might be related with the segmenting. I noticed that this will be yeah, the next topic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I I have two questions. Uh, I need need to get your advice. The first one is that um, when I present my slides, I know I want to make them simple, like those uh, 